Um, so I do this. I'm a developmental pediatrician. Um, I did all the pediatric training um, and then did three years of developmental pediatrics. But the place where I did my training was at the University of Virginia, which has a very large inpatient um, brain injury and spinal cord injury. So I spent six years doing inpatient and outpatient running clinics with kids with brain injury, really severe brain injuries. And we also had a kind of sideline of the kids with concussion. In, in Tucson, in Arizona, there are very few inpatient rehabilitation centers that take children. And so it's something we're trying to grow. But um, I end up seeing a lot of kids who just pay their hands and trying to help them get back to what they want to do. So, um, so I did this a lot for doctors, to try to get them to feel comfortable managing concussions. And the way that you get doctors engaged is you give them a test. Right, so that's why I do this. All right, because they want to always get the right answer. Um, a six-year-old boy collapses on the field after a head injury. He was hit hard in practice yesterday, he complained of a headache. The type of injury, this is the, what, what is the name for this? Chronic traumatic encephalopathy, recurrent traumatic encephalopathy, second impact syndrome, second injury, spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage. Give me an idea. It's called second impact syndrome. So what I want to do is they, there, there are two, two terms that get very people get confused about. So second injury is I'm going to show you a whole video and you need your Kleenex with that one. Um, is frequently confused with this, which is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. If you watch the news, the NFL just has been trying to settle with the football players to pay for all of their concussions. And what they're paying for is this. Now you'll see it in the, in the news, it's, they're paying for CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. It is recurrent lows. One after every time you are playing a game, you get hit, or you get hit 15 times a season. You get really hit really hard, and you taught you. I've read a lot of um, what the, the football players, the pro football players, have said. You know, they call it, they say they get hit really hard every game, and they some of them would forget games that they kept playing. This is one. This is not football player, but does anybody know this story? Chris Benoit was one of those wrestling guys that they throw each other around. <laughs> <laughs> and in June 2007, he shot his wife, shot his son, and hanged himself. And people at the time said, oh, steroid rage, look at him, right? Must, this must be drugs that did this to him. But when they did his autopsy, his brain had atrophy because of all of the hitting and being thrown around to about half the size that it was supposed to be. So he killed his wife and child and then killed himself because of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So the football players, a lot, many of the football players now are donating their brains when they eventually die to um, a, a research group in West Virginia. <coughs> And they are um, doing autopsies on football players as they die. And this is what they find the CTE. Now this is the other side. This is the second injury syndrome. So Zachary Leistat, and he, this, this boy's experience actually was the beginning of the change of how we manage concussions in high schools. He, um, he's in uh, Washington State, had a concussion the first time of the game, went back to play, collapsed, and this is the video that you need. When he was 13, Zachary Lystead of Maple Valley, Washington, near Seattle, loved to play football as much as his dad, Victor, loved watching him play. Oh, man, dude, he was awesome. Zach never shied away from going after the ball carrier when he was on defense. In October of 2006, Zach hit his head hard while making this tackle. There was an injury timeout, but just minutes later, Zach returned to the game. Had he stopped after his first hit and walked away, 
we'd have a different story to tell today. After the game, Zach and his father were walking off the field together when Zach collapsed, and the Lystead family's nightmare began. He's like, oh, Dad, my head hurts. It hurts real bad. I'm like, what's up? And then it progressively got worse. When he collapsed, he did, Daddy, don't, don't let me down. Don't let me down. Um, my dad, my head's killing me. That's the last thing I remember him saying, you know, for nine months. A comatose Zach was airlifted to Seattle's Harborview Medical Center. He was minutes maybe an hour away from dying. He had a bleed on the right and the left side of the brain that was compressing his brain, and that required them not only to take off the bone each side of his brain and leave it out, but actually take out the blood clot. When you looked into his eyes, he wasn't there. Zach would be at Harborview for 93 days. It took him nine months to speak. I remember uh, crying just to try and get my voice out. What's that like when you can't communicate what you're feeling? It, it sucks. It's the worst feeling in the world. I would never wish it on anyone. Get tall, get tall. Get tall. Let's go, Zach. Get tall, get tall. This is 19-year-old Zach Lystead today. Let's go push yourself, Zach. You gotta go faster now. Five years after his traumatic brain injury, a near miracle forged from countless hours of rehabilitation. Come on, Zach. You got it. Uh. And Zach's phenomenal courage and will. It took him three years to even be able to stand up on his own and get out of a chair. What's it feel like to be getting better at walking? Well, it feels good. It's like the most difficult thing I've had to do ever in my life. It's uh, worse than like talking to girls. Zach and his parents vowed to spare other families from their ordeal. So with their lawyer, they drafted a bill mandating protection for young athletes suspected of having a concussion, the Zachary Lystead Law. If a kid is, quote, suspected of having a concussion, unquote, they must be removed from play. The child can go back in to the practice or the competition, but only if they've been cleared by a licensed healthcare professional who's been trained in the evaluation and management of concussions. The bill passed both legislative houses in Washington state unanimously and was signed into law May 14, 2009. By 2010, Zach's story had drawn NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell's attention. We talked about getting this passed in a few states. He says, no, we're going to get it passed in all 50 states. As the NFL took the lead in advocating for the Lystead Law, the commissioner sent Zach this ball. The Lysteads sent him Zach's football card. He told my son, you know, Zachary, your card is the first thing I see on my desk when I come to work, and your card is the last thing I look at before I leave to go home. He even sent a message to Zach on the morning of June 10th, 2011, when Zach would try to walk across the stage to receive his high school diploma. Zachary Gordon Lystad! Oh, man, dude. Ah, the place erupted and it was, it was awesome. That was too much, man. It made me feel so happy. I felt so blessed in that moment. By changing the culture and getting laws passed in over 30 states now, kids are being saved. I think it's countless number of people over many decades that we're gonna see this has a very positive effect. Everyone has their challenges in life, and this is my challenge. It's my calling. So, we all have very fragile brains. Um, so, Arizona, 
Do we have a concussion law? Mm -hmm. Do we follow Washington? Yes, we do. Yay, Yay. yeah, mm -hmm. good for us. So this was passed in April 2011, and um, it was Arizona uh, State Bill 1521. And there were um, I, there were a lot of people who, who supported this, and it was it was really it was a great it was great to see it all come together. Um, and we were fairly early in, in um, putting our law together. So what has to happen is that there needs to be education. Um, a parent, the parent has to sign the release form at least yearly. Um, the, the athlete receives concussion training every year, and the um, coaches have to, and the trainers and everybody in the athletics has to be trained. Removal from play, if there's any concern, evaluation before return to play, um, written clearance from a training provider. And I, I, this was really nice because one of the things that came out was people said, well, you know, we have a lot of people in our community who volunteer on sports teams. I'm not going to present a risk being sued or having something happen if um, a player goes, I say the player can go back and they are injured. So there's a immunity for volunteers. So I think that's a really nice part of it. This was um, in 2011, this is what it looked like. The blue was um, everybody who had one and then the others were moving on. This is today. <laughs> but everybody else, the rest of us all have, have a concussion. Who are trained providers? Physicians, athletic trainers, nurse practitioners, physician's assistant, any of these people can clear? Has anybody ever done this? This is a great free training that's available through the, the CDC um, and the NFL. They collaborated. It's online, all you need to do is heads up to clinicians, but it's really not clinicians, it's anyone. Um, and it takes about 45 minutes to do it. It's, it's really good. I, I think everybody should do it. Um, I have all of our pediatric residents and medical students in um, Because I think it gives you a base of understanding about why we do what we do, and um, it gives us all speaking the same language. So um, I'm going to give a lot of information from this, but it's a really good thing to do at some point. Um, do you know who this is? She's willing to atone. Is that right about it? Yeah. Okay. So, um, Willie Tiotama was a uh, quarterback at the University of Arizona. And early on in his career at the U of A, he was hit hard, and um, they, he was the star quarterback. And of course, everybody, he's devastated, everybody's devastated because the team needs him, all of that. So um, he had tons and tons of evaluations trying to figure out when he was going to be ready to go back to play. And he was actually sent out of state because they wanted people in Arizona not to be biased and put him in too soon. So he was cleared um, and then went back to play and then got hit again and just wasn't doing well. They said, oh, he's not playing the way that we thought Willie Tumatama should play. So at the end of the season, and then he really took a break that spring. What they found is that all the testing that they had done on him after that first concussion, he actually was testing reflex-wise and uh, processing speed and all of that at the 98th percentile. And when they went back in the spring after he had rested and cleared his head and recovered actually from his concussion, they found that he was completely off the charts. He was so fast. So he tested well with a concussion, and the problem was we didn't know his baseline. Uh -huh. One of the coaches in, in TUSD um, told me last year, and I kept asking them again and again because I couldn't believe it. Of the kids who play sports in TUSD, and this is from two years ago, I think it's probably the same, half of them have a 504 plan or an IEP. I find it incredible. So when you're evaluating people, kids, to let them go back, we, half of them, have something that they need help with. I don't, you might not know what it is. 
So what, we don't know their baseline. So one of the great challenges with concussions is you want them to be good and back to their baseline before you let them go back to play. That's how we do them. Okay. So that was a problem with the tumor and it's a problem that a lot of the um, schools across the country are having trouble with is what's, what's normal for this athlete. So this is what doctors do when kids have had a, a concussion is come in, we ask them about how they're feeling, they do a good neurologic exam, ask about headache, fatigue, um, how are you being, are you think okay, do you, how, how's your mood, are you sleeping? But athletes, when they come to a position, they're coming there to get cleared to play. They lie. They all lie.
no television, no video games, all of that. Um, what we want them to do is be engaged in activity. The problem with electronics is that you tend to multitask. And when you're recovering from a concussion, you want to do what you're doing and live in the moment. And so that's one of the big reasons that we take it away. Also, the flashing and the lights on the television um, give them headaches, even, and they can though they say they don't. So um, we want them to, to rest um, and get good sleep. Um, they should be sleeping probably 10 hours a night. Again, for teenagers, that's hard to get them to do that. Um, and, um, and then the next issue um, comes up with a lot of these kids are, you know, they're doing so many things. And they're in an, uh, another activity, or they're an honor student. And if they don't do what they're supposed to do for a short period of time, they can get really behind very, very quickly. And so um, it can, it can, it can, this can ruin an academic career. So what do you do? Uh, what we do, actually, I'll, let me show you this video first. Um, this is a young lady who I have seen over the years. She's now a well, cheerleading captain for Rincon Rangers. Christina, or Corina Gallardo, excuse me, is this week's PCH comeback student athlete. She's also a senior at the University High School. A blow to Corina's face during a cheerleading stunt led to a broken nose. But an alert school nurse noticed Corina's injuries were a lot more extensive than anyone could have ever known. Bye. Fellow students and teammates know Corina Gallardo as a longtime dancer, cheerleader, and gifted student. Rangers! What yeah. most of them don't know, the broken nose she got as a freshman led to a traumatic brain injury, one she's still healing from now as a senior. The impact made her brain go back and forth, sort of like when you're in a car accident. It took quite some time to diagnose. Meanwhile, there was no question something was deeply wrong. Sudden onset of allergies, fatigue, attention deficit, personality changes, headaches, daily vomiting, and even scarier, She'd call me from the bathroom, you know, at school, and I'd have to explain. I kept, you know, her schedule with me so I could tell her where she was at. So the diagnosis of traumatic brain injury, although shocking, brought explanation and relief. Oh, my God, I'm not crazy. I learned a lot about my brain in the frontal lobe, how this controls your personality, your memory. Karina has to work much harder to keep up with school than she ever used to. She's now on Individualized Education Program, or IEP. I don't think anybody knows that I'm on an IEP, not even some of my closest friends, because... It's not something I guess you could say I'm proud of. Karina said some of her teachers were supportive, others were not. When you have an adult telling you that what you're doing is you're cheating yourself, you're cheating other students, which I had been told before, it really made me feel really lousy and like, well, why do I even have this? Seven, eight. The injury also limited what Karina can do in cheer. Sometimes we would use everyone in the, in the squad except for her. And I know that it hurt her. But our coach says Karina's definitely an asset. She's the most positive captain I have. <laughs> Karina also hopes talking about her brain injury will help raise awareness and understanding. There are some precautions that need to be taken to prevent these from happening. And if they do, the students, the teachers, and the coaches should all be aware of what's going on and that the students should get the help they need in recovering. Well, scary injury, but I tell you what, give her credit for battling back. She, she's an, uh, it's an interesting story, an amazing young woman. She, a, a couple of things. The whole story about the school nurse. Um, this <coughs> young lady was, came from eighth grade as um, one of their top students. She was just amazing. Um, and when she got to University High, really the academic school, they said, we think her, the reports that they sent from her eighth grade must be wrong because She's not that good. And um, it really took, um, the school nurse spent a lot of time saying, what in the world happened to you? And went back, and she's the one who put it all together. And eventually, I think, so this, her injury in the fall happened in August, right before she started school. And I saw her in November. So she had those three months of really doing terribly in school. One of the things that she developed, which we see, um, in kids who are more susceptible to concussions is something called acquired ADHD. If you have a hit to your frontal lobe, 
your, your, the front part of your brain is what helps us organize our thoughts, pay attention, um, look like you don't have ADHD. And a lot of times when kids have frontal lobe injuries, they, they, they were fine before, and they're, all right, they're sort of okay, but they look like they have ADHD. And so we needed to put on medications for that. The other thing that they were saying is, and there is the daily vomiting. What should happen was that she um, developed, um, with this injury, uh, anosmia, which is a loss of sense of smell. The, no, the nerve going to her nose when she felt like this was injured. So she couldn't smell. When you can't smell your food, it doesn't taste right. And particularly teenagers, I see them when they can't smell and they try to eat something, if it doesn't taste right, they gag and throw up. And so that's why she was throwing up. So for a while, the only thing that she would eat and keep down was this really, really spicy stew that her mom made. And it's made spices when you can't smell are good because they actually hit your pain receptors in your mouth and you feel something rather than cardboard. So she lived on chili stew for months. Um, but they thought that the staff, at the, a lot of the staff at the school, the psychology at the school, thought that she had developed an eating disorder. So she wasn't doing well academically, that thought that she had an emotional problem, with all of these things, it was all related to this concussion that she had had in office. So what do we do? What should we do in school? You know, honestly, I think that the, the coaches and um, the trainers at schools are doing a really good job. Um, people are following the law, they're pulling out kids, they're getting them evaluated. Um, the challenge comes when kids go back to school because they look okay. Having a concussion is an invisible injury. You don't look like there's anything wrong with you. And so you've got all of these issues that you, you're having trouble with and it's hard to, to share that. And, and a lot of teenagers won't. They don't want to share it. They actually want to deny that it ever happened. So they start having trouble. So what do we do? A lot of times we'll send them back with shorter days, rest breaks, um, a reduced workload. One of the big things that, 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 I, that I ask, and I know it's really hard, is that whatever, what the, the work that they missed while they were out should be forgiven, not made up. Because when you have to make it up, you then have to keep up with everybody else, and you're working hard, and you've got this stress of the things that you have to do in addition, and you're trying to recover and rest. And so all of that, it, it really doesn't work very well. So I know that some things cannot be forgiven, that anything that can be forgiven is, is, is a good thing to do. Um, more time to turn to work, longer time for tests. A lot of these kids are very sensitive to sounds in the environment or lights or things like that as they're recovering from a concussion. And so they'll be easily distracted while they're taking the test. So if you move them away to a quieter place um, to take the test off, they'll do better. Um, this is impact um, testing. Anybody heard of or used impact testing? This is an um, online uh, electronic neuropsychological assessment. Um, it's used um, in a lot of schools to give you a baseline um, for kids. So what will happen is that an entire football team will take this test in August before they start training. And then if you're injured during the season, you have to take the test again and your score has to be the same or better than your baseline before you go back to play. So again, it's another way to get around the line. Um, what, what it does is it, it tests different things. The problem with it is it tests cognitive um, issues. Uh, concentration, recognizing patterns, um, visual memory, auditory memory, it tests all of that. It does not test balance and physical strength. You need another test for that. Um, <coughs> this is what I used to do. This, this doesn't happen anymore, but pediatric residents used to um, work all day go to work in an ICU or something in the night, and then come back to me to clinic the next day and work with me the next day. 
they looked awful. And so I was curious as to what their impact would look, their impact testing would look like. So what I did is, this is a, one of the pediatric residents, I took away her name, but she, I tested her at the beginning of her rotation when she was tested. <coughs> and then, a couple weeks later, I tested her after she hadn't slept all night. And I did this, I did this for fun on most of them. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, this, is, this is sleep deprivation. What it looks like on an impact test. Um, and what you see is this report, it comes back. Here's baseline, here's post-injury. So her complaint, she was 100%. And she got, she got, she's a really smart doctor who just aced this test. But sleep deprived, she went from 100% visual memory to 53%. And this is the, a very typical pattern that we will see with somebody with a concussion. Sleep, concussion, anything you do in your brain is not good. So what we do um, before the season, we want to make sure that everybody's trained, everybody's on the same page, um, everybody's educated, and then pick some tests that you want to, that everybody agrees that you can use as a baseline. You really, really need a baseline test, as again, um, if you're the same, you have the same data as in Tucson, you have no idea what their baseline is. Um, during the season. Um, just a lot of, of making sure that students feel comfortable being able to tell you that they, that they got hit. Um, a lot of things, the equipment piece, there's all kinds of technology that people think that technology is in their mind, but we really don't have a perfect helmet. And so just getting a fancy helmet doesn't help. And that's it. This is, a, um, this is my daughter, she's 18 months old, and I'm paranoid about concussions. My kids, um, they, she's, she's not mine, but they, this is when she was little, and I, I really wanted to bubble wrap them, because I was so afraid their heads were gonna hit. My kids, for entertainment, when we drive from Tucson to Union back, they um, will um, count people, motorcyclists who are, Right, you, party with helmets. <laughs> so they don't do license plates, they do more like this. And they also will oh, be at a park, and there's a kid running around on a bike with no bicycle helmet. And both of them will go up to this child and say, You're not wearing a helmet, my mommy's going to see you in the hospital. <laughs> so they know uh, what they're supposed to do. Questions for Dr. Price? Two screens to your um, your three instruments that you're using to establish basic. Yeah, thank you. There, there, these are more that you can. What you need to do is um, pick a mixture. You need to do a physical assessment, look at their balance, and you need to do a cognitive assessment. So how long is the recovery time? In general, for a, a typical concussion that's going to re get a resolve without much problem, it's about two months. But Karina, the, the, the video that you saw, um, she's still symptomatic five years out. I, there, we're, one of the things that we're working on in, in research is, initially, would it be really great that we, if we could just have a blood test that says you've had a concussion, you haven't had a concussion? And there, there was a lot of research actually happening with that. A couple years ago, we thought we had one, and then the test didn't really pan out. But what it would do is it, the, the fluid that is in your brain is different than the fluid that is in your blood. So we could, with a concussion, find what is released, and then have a test for that. We could say whether or not you had a concussion. So that is, that's on the horizon. That is, that is gonna come out, which it's just not here yet. Um, so, and, and then the other thing is, is it, it's really remarkable. I see some kids who have a really bad brain injury. And I mean, bleeds and all kinds of trauma. And they do really well. And somebody like Karina, who five years out is still in so much trouble from a, just a fairly simple concussion. Why? We think that there are, Different, there's a different makeup of people that certain people are more resistant and more resilient 
to concussions, and certain people are much more fragile and susceptible. And there's another area of research right now trying to figure out if there's a blood test that says, you're fragile, you don't play football. Okay. Or you're, resi you're very resilient, you can get as many concussions as you want. So it, there really seems to be a personal, individual um, piece to this. Yeah. When you said about the assessment and their release to play, isn't a concussion, from what I'm understanding and what I've read, for, like they get progressively <coughs> worse before they get better, so the assessment right then and there might not be as valid as maybe two weeks later when they have the full blown symptom of, or is, are the symptoms full blown right at impact more so than they would be in two months? So the trajectory of after a concussion, um, you have symptoms right then, even if you say you don't, and um, you get better. You do not get worse. Okay. Sometimes kids complain more because, because they're, they're recognizing the symptoms. But <coughs> the trajectory for, in general, actually across brain injury concussions, your trajectory is to get better. If you got worse, you re-bled or you had something else happen in your brain. Okay. So no, it is, it's always better. Okay. We have a child that's also started in August. He just recently got away. He had a TBI when he was six months. I'm not sure if he was shaking or if he fell. Um, we're worried because in August he was very focused and he was able to, like, we would have group discussions and he was really involved. And now it seems like he's regressing. I don't know if we can do anything like how it said, maybe, maybe he's going to be electronics or he's not resting or is yeah. he going back? He shouldn't, from his brain injury, he shouldn't be getting worse. So, but he may not, might not be sleeping. I, sleep is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and so many kids with, with electronics in the home, you know, the television going all the time, or um, having access to, it's really hard to let go of the iPad. Um, they're staying up to 10, even little kids are staying up to 10, 11 at night mm -hmm. playing electronics. Mm -hmm. So, um, I see a, a lot of kids who come for, for evaluation of learning disabilities, ADHD, any kind of problem in school, and the problem is, is that they're not sleeping. And once we fix sleep, we fix school. And I never give them a, all we gotta do is fix them. Still bleeding, you get hit again. 
So that's exactly what happened to him. He got hit once, and at that point, as the neurosurgeon said, he should have just stopped. He would have been fine. But he went and got, and, and that second hit does not have to be very hard. It was just enough. Because what happens when you have a concussion is that the metabolism in your brain doesn't work like it's supposed to. So our brain every day is using glucose and moving calcium and doing all of these things, all of this metabolic processing. When you have a concussion, that it works differently. And when you get hit, and it's not as resilient. And so what happens is, and what happened to Zachary is, he had this fragile brain just concussed. When he got hit again, he had immediate brain swelling because his brain couldn't handle that second hit. Yeah. So it was a second hit. Quick question. Uh, that you say concussion, is there a more susceptible part of the brain where it's more susceptible to concussion rather like the front of the head or the back of the head? I know it's still concussion, but where is it the more susceptible where you can receive one? There are you can, right. So it, you know, there's not a more susceptible part, sort of. Um, we, we, if you do an MRI after somebody's having a concussion, it's normal. So we can't see a concussion. Um, the, the, one of the things is that you're in the temporal area, the bone is thinner, and so there's less protection. So sometimes that could be if you got hit a baseball right here. Um, it's probably going to fracture and probably have more injury underneath. The rest of your, the bones of your brain are a little more protective. When I see kids in the hospital, I see almost every child is admitted at um, the university, at, at Diamond Children's um, Hospital, who has a brain injury, I see them while they're in the hospital because I'm going to see them later. And if a, if a child has had a, bone, a skull fracture, a lot of times parents are really worried about that. And I'll walk in, and what I say is, congratulations, your child had a skull fracture. That is awesome. Because what it means is that some of the force was diffused, and it didn't go directly to the brain. It's actually one skull fracture. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but, but it, it is, it, there isn't a one part of your brain. The, the place of injury that we see the most is frontal lobes, because of this flexion extension or the straight hit to the front of the head. And in car accidents, kids will hit the windshield. So the most common one we see is frontal, but it can be more. You know, I was curious about the law. You know, there was an incident happening in Arizona this year where a young man died at one of the smaller schools up on the reservation school. They don't have trainers, and uh, you know, they rely a lot on one coach watching all the, the football players. Is there any early laws about schools that don't have? Because I think 50, myself, staff the other day, 54 or 56 percent of schools in America have trainers. Is there anything in the works to where if you don't have that person on the sideline to make some laws to prevent the game from happening or anything like that? Because in half the schools, really, there's not a trainer. So there's, there's and parents are kind of limited up in the stands. Have you heard any more discussion about that, by chance of what they're doing in situations like that? There's a huge push to close down those teams. And I'm not sure where it is, but I've heard that there, that the safety issue is becoming um, bigger than human condition. Yeah. You got here, um, Susan Wall, <coughs> or Scotland, you guys, and she was talking about um, computer games that would help to train the brain to recover. Yes. There are some. Yes. yes that actually do the, the challenges that if you have. Um, what I find with teenagers is that if you give them a phone or an iPad, they don't do their homework computer game, they do the play. And so if you can actually, there are, there's one called Brain Games, there's a couple of them, CogQ, there's a couple of them that are actually quite good, but um, they have to do it and not text. <laughs> And the the <coughs> soccer <coughs> FIFA that, that has has sponsored some uh, studies, and it's interesting because their studies show that there's no problem. Um, but some other studies show that there's a lot of problem. 
particularly um, with the younger kids. Um, so there, there, in theory, from what I've read, there, there is a way to have the ball that's safer than other ways. And so the problem is, is that the younger kids have to learn that, and they have a much more fragile brain. So a lot of um, soccer teams are not allowing the little kids to have the ball. Um, but yes, but there's a fair amount of research showing that it, it's, a, it's a problem. Um, it's one of those recurrent small injuries 